have a couple of quick announcements to make before our guest speaker comes today. But uh, once again, greetings and welcome here to Roseau Baptist Church. Things are going to be a little bit different today in that we have a special speaker from the Creation Ministries International. He'll be giving a presentation here during the main service and also during the community group hour following the main service. We'll have a little kind of intermission there in between so you can grab a, another cup of coffee or some water, use the restrooms, things like that. But I encourage you, if you don't normally stick around for that second hour, I'd appreciate it if you'd stick around. I know that these are, there's going to be some great information that we're going to get today and some things to help strengthen our faith and have some evidence behind what we believe. A couple of things, though, coming up. Don't forget, two weeks from today, we're going to have our Thanksgiving uh, dinner together as a church family there on Sunday evening at 5 o'clock on November 20th. So feel free to sign up in the back at the table there in the back. If you're coming, put it down that you're coming and your name and how many people from your family are going to be coming or friends or coworkers, whoever else you may be inviting. Invite anybody who wants to come. We'd love to have people here. And then also sign up to bring something. And if you don't like to drive at night, as time change happened today, and I know it's going to be getting dark at like 5 o'clock, 5.30 now, we've got our church van, we've got people willing to pick you up. So if you would like to be here, but you just don't feel comfortable driving in the evening, use a connection card, put down, I'd like to come, but I need a ride. So please, if you could do that sooner than later, that would really help us out so we can get all that scheduling done because we want everybody here that would like to participate. And then as we move into the Christmas season, we got a couple of special Christmas events coming up. Our gingerbread house decorating party is going to be the first Sunday in December. They're on December 4th, and we'll have a couple of different hours uh, happening in that Sunday afternoon. But the week prior to that, on that Monday, the last Monday there in November, we're going to be here at the church mixing everything up, doing lots and lots of baking. So if you are able to help out with that, then please, again, use a connection card. Say, I'd like to participate. How can I help? And we'll get you all the rest of the information. And then a couple of days after that, we'll actually be constructing the houses, putting together all the glue icing stuff and uh, putting those together. So that way when the kids come during the party, all they have to do is get a little pile of icing and dump candy and cereal treats and all kinds of stuff all over. It's always a lot of fun. And so I encourage you even to come out and be a part of that. And then something new that we're doing this year on that following Friday, December 9th, we're calling it Parents' Night Out. And the idea behind this is just to be a service to the community. It hit me a few months ago, and it's often been said, if our church disappeared tomorrow, would our community know it? And yeah, there are some things that possibly, but the fact that we had our fall festival uh, a month ago now, and we had neighbors literally two blocks away from here that said, I had no idea you guys were here. I got the mailer. That is a testament that we need to be more active in providing services, providing things for our community, and being a witness, being a light for the gospel. And so that was kind of one of the uh, things that we decided, all right, what can we do? How can we help? Well, Parents are stressed out. Lots of things happening. Well, we're going to provide a free night of child care. And if you have little kids or grandkids, you know how expensive babysitting is becoming right now. So we're providing a free night of child care. We'll feed them dinner. We're going to have some movies. We'll have some other fun activities happening. Of course, the Christmas story is going to be a part of that. And so if you'd like to help with that, we would love to have you here helping and just helping to corral. We've got 50 slots open wow, 50 kids, what are we going to do with 50 kids? We're going to have a lot of fun. That's what we're going to do with 50 kids. And so that Friday night, we'd love to have you come out and grab some of these flyers. We're also in the process of getting some business card size things uh, that will have the gingerbread house on one side, the parents' night out on the other side. We'll have those here by next Sunday. So that way you can be passing those out, keep them in your pocket, keep them in your car, pass them out. Anybody looks like they've got kids' age, give them out and say, hey, it's free. We'd love to have you come. Be a part of it. Utilize this resource. So pass those out and grab some of those. These flyers are at that back table also as you kind of enter into the back hallway. And so we want to definitely just be a wonderful light for the gospel in our community. And with that also being said about our kids' ministries, I know I mentioned this last week. If you serve in any of our ministries, children, nursery, youth, anyone under the age of 18, if you are over the age of 18, According to now, the state of California, you must be fingerprinted in order to serve. 
And so we have those forms filled out. All you will need to do is take it down to anybody that does fingerprinting or what they call live scanning. UPS stores, lots of other places do it, but UPS store especially, you can just go in there, you hand them the form, they roll your fingers, you're done. That's all you got to do. I mean, you're done unless all of a sudden we get a report back that says you're some kind of, you know, person that shouldn't be serving with kids. And then, sorry, you can't help. But I'm not anticipating that's going to happen. So, but the reality is this is just another step that we want to do to provide safety for the kids. And we want to also be good law-abiding citizens here in our state and in our country. And so if you are serving in kids or youth ministries, please don't leave today without getting one of those forms. Debbie has those. She's back in the sound booth today, but I know she was tracking down a lot of you as you were coming in, but if you don't have one of those yet, please don't leave without getting one. <sighs> okay, now that we got all that stuff out of the way. We like to read this passage as a way of preparing our hearts uh, for the teaching of God's word as we come to the scriptures and as we come to this time to be able to learn God's truth. Let's read from Psalms 86 as a prayer. And begin. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. I will praise you, Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever, for great is your love toward me. And now I'm uh, pleased to be able to introduce uh, Mr. Scott Gillis, who is with Creation Ministries International. And I'm excited to have him be able to give us some information and be able to help us have evidence that defends the scriptures and what we believe is God's story of creation and how he has made us as special and loves us. And still today we can trust in the truth of God's word. So, yes, the kids can be dismissed to go to the kids church at this time. And then, Brother Scott, come on up. You are on. Thank you. I, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, I've already had a bunch of people ask me who is Creation Ministries International, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, answer that question for you. We literally are international, and we have offices in seven countries on five continents. We were founded over 45 years ago. Uh, we speak in over 1,000 churches worldwide every year, and we employ more PhD scientists than any ministry in the world. However, that's not really what we're about. It's not about science. And let me explain that. How many of you, when you've been out maybe sharing your faith, have had people challenge you with questions like this? I mean, did God really create in six days? I mean, science has proven that evolution and its millions of years are an absolute fact. So that can't be true. What about dinosaurs? How did all the animals fit on the ark? Hasn't evolution proven that the Bible is not true? What about ape men? What about carbon dating? Why would a loving God create creatures that can kill? And where did all the races come from? Do me a favor. If you've had people challenge you with questions like that, would you raise your hand? Now, keep it up and look around the room. See, that's what our ministry is about, to answer those and many more questions. And you can find the answers to those and many more questions on our website. Now, our website address is kind of hard to remember, so we're going to do a little science this morning. Is that okay? I don't know if you guys knew this, but scientists have proven that if you say something out loud audibly with your mouth, you're more apt to have it imprinted into your brain. Did you guys know that? So would you guys all join me in saying this together, please? Creation.com. Now, can you remember that? And if you would go there this afternoon, you'd find over 15,000 articles written by our scientists and professionals over 40 years, answering those and many more questions. For example, you guys know this fellow. I mean, we got some tragic news a number of years ago. What happened? He died. He died and how did he die? A stingray stung him in the heart. And people wrote into our ministry and challenged us, as they often do. And they said, oh, yeah? Well, why would a loving God create stingrays that can kill? Gotcha. But you know what? It's a fair question. It deserves an answer. And so our scientists and professionals wrote this article, giving a biblical and scientific answer to that challenge. And in only 10 days, it became our most visited article ever. 
And the reason is, is because people that signed up for our free email newsletter, they received this article and they forwarded it on to their family and friends, showing them that there are biblical and scientific answers to those challenges that people have. And am I right in the news we hear all the time about the latest dinosaur discovery that allegedly proves evolution or perhaps the missing link between ape-like creatures and men? Have you guys seen those articles? Every week they're there. But please know that if you sign up for our free email, email newsletter, you'll receive those articles and you can become part of our ministry spreading this information and around. So if my friends could go ahead and distribute these sign-up sheets right now, all we need is just a, a zip code, your email address. We'll keep you up to date. It only comes out about once a week, so we're not going to be spamming you, but we'll keep you up to date on the latest information. So if you guys could fill that out and pass those to the back, that would be great. But how many people here know that kids hear about evolution 24-7? Now, if that's the case, where are they going to hear a different story, a biblical one? Is it going to be when they go to school? How about when they turn on TV, right? Certainly by the time they get to be in university. So please understand the heart of our ministry is to equip you with answers to the tough questions people have about the Bible so that you can show them the gospel of Christ and they can come to know Jesus Christ, our Savior. And the answers to those questions, again, can be where, everybody? All right, great. Let's go ahead and get started with the presentation. Now, I did mention that we are an international ministry and many of our speakers are from other countries and you can probably tell because of my funny accent that I come from a foreign land. <laughs> it's true. It's a place called California. I don't know if you've heard <laughs> of it, but I actually, I actually uh, have lived here quite a number of decades, but I'm not a native California. Okay, I was not born and raised here, but when I did move into this state, I had to adapt to my environment because as a scientist, I know every good organism needs to adapt to their environment. To prove to you that I did, here's me catching a wicked 12-inch wave. <laughs> and thankfully, I have a graphic artist that works for me that makes me look a little bit more macho than I really <laughs> am. But I would like to introduce you to my friend Sammy. Now, Sammy is a native Californian, born and raised here. He fits the stereotype, loves to surf, but he's also a professional California Beach lifeguard. Now, many years ago, he was assigned to Pismo Beach, but it was his day off. So what he did is he took his quad and he was riding up and down the sand dunes all day long, enjoying his time off. Until, as the sun hit the Pacific Ocean, he knew it was time to ride back to camp and rest up for his next day's work. However, a storm had come in as well. But as he came to this very spot on the beach, as he was going back to camp, there were 12 people in the darkness yelling and screaming to get his attention. He came over, he turned off his engine, and he found out why they were excited, because you see there was a surfboard at their feet. But in this case... The surfer was 100 yards off, screaming, in pain because his body was being picked up by waves with eight-foot faces thrown into the rocks below, and he was severely lacerated from head to toe. So Sammy did take off his boots and his helmet, and those things would weigh him down, and was able to find a rip current during these torrential and horrible waves, and was able to get to this man and brought him back to shore, and with medical help, saved him his life. But let me ask you guys a question this morning. Why did he do that while the 12 people stood there and watched? Why? Tell me. He trained. He was equipped. He knew how to navigate through those waves. And you know, I think the surf is kind of like our culture. You know, the people are being challenged with questions. Questions like, is there a God? Does he love me? And how about this one? Is the Bible true? And am I right, in our culture, that question has been answered with a resounding no. Because most people have been told that evolution, along with its millions of years, are scientific fact. And if that's the case, they believe the Bible can't be true. I, I believe it's like a tsunami that are pulling people away from the truth of God's solid word, that rock on which we are called to stand. But 
I would like to start out with a question for all of us this morning, and that is, are you willing to equip and train yourself with the answers to the tough questions that are rampant in our culture today, that are being thrown at the church, so that you can be the one that dives in and rescues the perishing, while perhaps others stand by and watch? You know, 1 Peter 3.15 says always, be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Now, does this sound like a suggestion or a command? It's a command for every believer. And by the way, this word answer comes from a Greek word, which was a legal term. It was used in the courts of law. It meant a reason, rational, logical defense. Okay? The word, the word is apologian. Now, question, does this sound like you? Do you have a reasoned, rational, logical defense for the questions that people are asking in our culture, challenging a straightforward reading of the Bible? Does this sound like you? Now, I, I know that I mentioned that we have a lot of scientists that work for us, and you're thinking, you know, science is something that we do in school. Why would we talk about that in church? But did you know that there are actually some scientific statements in the Bible? In fact, in the very first chapter of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, there's a phrase that occurs 10 times. It says that God created plants and animals to reproduce after their what? Kind. Now that basically means dogs give birth to dogs and pigs give birth to pigs and corn kernels bring us corn plants. And that happens here in Northern California too, right? Now, to be, to, be, to be fair, indeed, what it's basically saying is that the genetic information, the DNA that God created in those original kinds is passed on to future generations. And although God built into all his creatures the ability to adapt to their environment through natural selection and after the fall, random mutations, nonetheless, the Bible is very clear that God created plants and animals to reproduce after their kind. However, most people hear a very different story than that, don't they? Most people hear that over millions and millions and millions of years, as creatures pass on their genetic information, their DNA to future generations, that over a span of millions of years, a change can occur so much that one kind of creature can change into a completely different kind. Now, do you see the difference between these two accounts? And you know, our kids, they know both of these things can't be true. They're smart. You know, and if, if the teacher in the science class might be saying, now, when we're dealing with science, we're dealing with facts. However, if you happen to be one of those people that goes to church and you believe Bible stories, and if those Bible stories give you hope and purpose and meaning in your life. I won't hold that against you. You can believe your Bible stories. But while we're here in science class, here we talk about facts. Now, do you see the decision that has to be made? And it's not just our kids, am I right? I mean, do any of you have family members that think you're maybe just a little uh, unintelligent to believe the Bible's account of creation? So the question is, are we equipped with a defense, with a reason, rational, logical defense for our faith? And if we're not, what's going to happen? You know, perhaps you've heard the Barnett Institute statistics that say that two-thirds of children raised in Christian homes by the time they get to be the age of 18 are leaving the faith. Have you guys heard that? I mean, that's sobering, isn't it? And of course we're talking about somebody else's kids, not ours, right? Now, to be fair, other organizations have done other surveys and come up with completely different percentages of those leaving the faith. But can I ask you a question? Which percentage would be acceptable to you and your family? You know, we went on to college campuses here in the United States and made this brief documentary. We actually came in and did, did a, a survey on video where we first asked for students that had regularly attended church in the past. And once we found that group, we asked them a question. Do you believe in creation or evolution? 
Not surprisingly, but the vast majority said they believed in evolution. Then we asked them a follow-up question. We said, well, have you ever been given any historical and scientific evidence that supports the historical account of the Bible? And all of those that said they believed evolution, with the exception of one man, said no. And none of them then said they went to church anymore. However, of the five, and only five students that were willing on camera to admit that they believed the biblical account of creation. We asked them if they had been given his, any scientific evidence that supported the historical account of uh, the account of the Bible, and they unanimously said absolutely yes, they had, and all of them continued to attend church to that day. So I hope you can see why it's so important for us to have a defense for our faith, not just for the sake of our children and grandchildren, but what about our neighbors who don't know Christ? What about our coworkers, the ones we're called to share the gospel with that have an intellectual barrier to even considering the Bible to be true in the first place? Who is going to tell them that side? I mean, Jesus himself, he said, I've spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. Then how will you believe when I speak of heavenly things? And that's why we're here today. That's why CMI does employ more PhD scientists than any ministry in the world to give you an easy to understand scientifically accurate as well as biblically accurate answer to your questions. Now, since we are talking about science this morning, I think it's very important for you to understand a concept about what really science is. A lot of people get confused on this. You know, science, actually, when most people think of it, they think of what we call operational or experimental science. And then perhaps you remember when you were in junior high school, you used the scientific method. Do you remember that? Remember? When you develop a hypothesis, you perform an experiment, you make observations, you record data, and you could repeat it. Do you guys remember using the scientific method? You could test things in the laboratory right here in the present, you know, for example, let's say someone here this morning did not believe in the law of gravity. Okay, we could actually do an experiment, make observations, record data, we could repeat it. You see, this is the kind of science that's done right in the present, perhaps in the laboratories right before our eyes, that gives us discoveries that will help us do evolution, or for that matter, anything that happened in the past, okay, it's not this kind of science. See, what we're talking about there is historic, or what many call forensic science. Now, let's say similarly that someone here believed that a fish over millions and millions of years passing on its genetic information to many future generations, that one of its offspring through the process of natural selection and random mutations would eventually sprout new novel structures that would allow it to walk onto land. All right, now, if you believe that to be the case, can you do an experiment that shows it's true? Can you observe it happening? Is it repeatable? Now, do you see the difference here? Now, for example, this is a fossil right here, okay? Let me ask you a question. Does this fossil exist in the past or the present? Okay, I heard some different answers. Let me see if I can clarify the question for you. Does this fossil, this one right here that I'm holding in my hand, does this fossil exist in the past or the present? Present. You see, all the evidence we have with us exists in the present. And when a paleontologist digs up a dinosaur, tell me, does it come with a label on it that tells us how old it is or how it lived or how it ate? 
No, what we have to do is take the evidence that's with us in the present and we paint a picture of what happened in the past. And that's because you see the evidence, it does not speak for itself. It must be interpreted. Now, with a show of hands, let's do a little vote. Let's see what you think. Who has the most evidence, evolution or creation? How many people say evolution has the most evidence? Okay, how many people say creation has the most evidence? All right, um, can I do a follow-up question? When the paleontologists are looking at the fossil record that's available to us in the present, in the various museums, as well as in the paleontological digs around the world, do the creation scientist and the evolutionary scientist, do they have the same or different evidence to observe in the present? Same. same. And when an astronomer is looking through his telescope at a distant galaxy, okay, and the light maybe and the waves are coming back into his spectrometer, do the creation scientist and the evolutionary scientist, do they have the same or different evidence to observe in the present? Same. same. So now let me ask you the question again. Who has the most evidence, evolution or creation? Okay, some of you guys are getting it, but I got some deer in the headlights looks from some. So let's go ahead and do our own little experiment. Take a look at this fact, make your observations. Here's the hypothesis I would like you to consider. What is missing or what was this originally? I'm gonna make it easier, I'm gonna make it multiple choice. How many people say it was A? How about B? How about C? Got one optimist in the crowd, thank you. How about D? How many people say it was D? Okay, you wanna know the answer? Now wait, I want you to think about this before you respond. Why did you look for something missing? Exactly, I asked you to. I did what I call, what we call in science, that's I gave you a presupposition. That's a long word that means an assumption when looking at the evidence. So congratulations, everyone here. Your conclusion was completely consistent with your presupposition, which was completely wrong. And I know some of you are thinking that I tricked you, but you know, that was really my point. In fact, the next thing that I'm going to share is probably the most important thing for you to remember from this morning especially students if you're in here, I want you to remember this. That when you're watching a program on evolution, you are not being given facts. You're being given an interpretation of facts that's based on a presupposition in that case that has some very, very serious scientific problems. And I think we need to be like the Bereans. Do you guys remember them in the Bible who wanted to find out what the truth was? And shouldn't we do that all the more in this situation as well? You know, historic science is like that television show CSI. And I don't know if uh, Pastor David allows you to watch such programs. I, I only do so for research purposes myself. However, <laughs> if you haven't seen the program, you'll know that scientists are digging up facts and evidence about a crime that happened in the past. And these facts and evidence are brought into the courtroom right there in their present before a jury as well as two opposing attorneys. And yet one attorney is saying, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you've seen the facts and evidence right here in the present right before your eyes and obviously you can see my client is innocent. Yet the other attorney is saying, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I don't know what facts and evidence he's referring to because obviously He's guilty, and now this one's gonna say, wait, did you notice he's misinterpreting the facts? And this one's going, no, he's misinterpreting. But folks, same evidence, same facts, two completely different and opposing interpretations, and it's up to the jury to discover and to decide which one makes the most sense. However, in this case, in the creation evolution debate, most people in our culture, am I right, have only heard one side of the story. And when it comes to your neighbors, your coworkers, your children and grandchildren, you know, they did, who, who is going to tell them the other side? All right, we're gonna take a look at a little bit of evidence that makes sense of the historical account of the Bible. And I'm gonna start out with an icon of evolution in millions of years, namely 
the Grand Canyon, which gives me an excellent opportunity to slip in a family vacation shot. But if you were to go to the Grand Canyon today, you would, of course, be told that it took millions of years for these layers to be laid down and millions and millions of years for that canyon to be eroded. And indeed, when we look at the process of sedimentation, how it happens today, it is a very, very slow process. So if what happens today is what has always happened in the past, then I would grant you it had to have taken millions of years. However, did you know that the evidence is overwhelming that these layers were laid down by water? And where do we find massive layers like this? I mean the Grand Canyon to be sure, but did you know that no matter where you go on this planet, if you start digging, you're going to find massively deep layers of sedimentary rock. And guess what you find inside those layers, folks? So. Let me ask you a question. Can you think of anything that might explain, that's in the Bible, a historical account of the Bible, that might explain massive sedimentary layers covering the entire planet, including the evidence of dead things? Does anything come to mind? You know, and I had, a, I had a man come up to me at this time, and he goes, you've got to be kidding. You believe the Bible's account of a worldwide flood? Because you know what? Your Bible says that the highest mountains in the world were covered by water, and there's not enough water to do that. Ha, gotcha. So how do you answer a question like that? Well, I get excited, because I can show him this. You know, perhaps you remember in junior high school that 70% of our planet is covered by immensely deep oceans. In fact, did you know this, that if you were able to take the ocean basins and raise them up and push the continents and the mountains down and reform our planet, just like it was a perfect sphere, like a basketball, did you know that there would be almost two miles of water covering this planet with just the water that's in the ocean basins today? Now, does that sound like enough water for a cataclysmic flood like the worldwide, like the Bible tells us about? And you know what? It's even more exciting than that. Because you see, in the sedimentary layers at the top of the highest mountain ranges in the world, including Mount Everest, we find fossilized marine invertebrates. That's clams and crabs indicating that these layers that are at the top of the highest mountains in the world were one time underneath the oceans, just like God's word has been telling us all along. So, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, do you see the evidence? It supports the historical account of the Bible as opposed to the evolutionary idea of millions of years. And speaking of those layers taking millions of years, how about this? Here's 24 feet of thousands of layers of rock. Now, did these take millions of years? Or you would think at least thousands of years. But no, in this case, these layers were laid down in three hours. And that was on June 12th, 1980, right after the eruption of Mount St. Helens, which made a little impact on me since I was 63 miles from the volcano when it erupted. And this is only a little bit of the ash that was three inches thick in my parents' front yard. Also, an excellent opportunity to slip in yet another family vacation shot. But <laughs> if you were to go to Mount St. Helens on your vacation, you would run into this canyon. Now, this canyon is a very large. It's 1 40th the scale of the Grand Canyon. And if you weren't there to see it formed, you would logically assume that it took a really long time for that little bitty river to carve through those layers of rock, but you would actually be wrong because this canyon was formed in only one day. That was on March 19th, 1982, after a flow came through here at highway speed, cutting through the then soft layers, which have now been turned to rock. Does that remind you of anything else you've seen before? You see, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, consider the evidence and facts. They support the historical account of the Bible as opposed to the evolutionary timeline of millions of years. 
Now that same man that challenged me about the water, he came up and he said, now wait, you're always talking about fossils. And everybody knows that it takes millions of years to form a fossil. Ha, gotcha again. So how do you answer a question like that? Well, I get excited. We can talk about, really, where do fossils come from? Now, if you were to go to a museum or perhaps open a textbook or watch a program on television, you would likely hear a story like this where Mr. Dinosaur dies, sinks to the bottom of the ocean, is slowly buried over millions and millions of years until through the process of permineralization, which also they would say takes millions of years, then finally through an erosional event or perhaps a paleontological dig, we discover Mr. Dinosaur. Now, I will admit at one time that made sense to me, but is this what we witness in the real world? You see, a number of years ago, I took my daughter to Walmart, and I bought her two goldfish. She named them Romeo and Juliet. Now, that was on a Thursday. It was just two days later. It was a Saturday morning, 5 a.m. I hear her calling from her room, Daddy, Daddy, look, look, hurry, Daddy, come here, look, look. And I want to let you know, it's Saturday morning at 5 a.m. I'm a very patient father as I came into her room and said, what? She goes, look, Daddy, Romeo is kissing Juliet. <laughs> and being of a more objective observer at that time than she, I rubbed my eyes, took a closer look, and let her know, no, actually, Romeo is, well, eating Juliet. Poor, poor Juliet. And if any of you have fish tanks at home and one of your precious fish die, where do you find it? floating on top. If you don't believe me, you can do an experiment this afternoon. All you need is a drop of cyanide. Put it. No, no, you don't want to do that. <laughs> this is what's going to happen if you do that. And is it true that when we're watching a high definition documentary about ocean life, that when the cameras come on the ocean bottom, we see dozens, let's say even thousands of creatures lying there fully intact, waiting to be buried slowly over millions of years? Is that what we observe? No, you see, if I really wanted to make a fossil of my daughter's remaining goldfish, what I had to do was get a shovel of concrete, sneak into her room in the middle of the night, and then throw it in there really quick. No, I didn't do that. <laughs> but do we have any evidence that supports this idea that the only way we can get a fossil is through rapid catastrophic burial like we would witness in a worldwide flood like the Bible tells us about? Well. Take a look at this. Here's a fish that was buried so quickly it was caught right in the middle of having lunch. Or how about this? Here's an ichthyosaur in the process of giving birth. Now, ladies, I've heard your stories of very long labors, but really millions of years. How about this? Here's a hat that was buried for only 20 years. You might say it evolved from a soft hat into a hard hat. Or in this case, we have a bag of flour after only decades turned to stone. Or how about this? Here's a teddy bear that was completely calcified after only three to five months. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, do you see the evidence, the facts, support the historical account of the Bible of creation as opposed to the evolutionary account of millions of years? Now, I would like to pause here for a moment and ask you guys a question. Those examples that I just shared with you, were they difficult to understand? I mean, was I talking over anybody's head? Do you guys understand those? Now, more importantly, can you picture yourself sharing that kind of information with your children, your grandchildren? Or how about your neighbors who don't know Christ? Who believe that evolution has proven that the Bible's history is wrong? Or how about our co-workers that don't know? I hope you can see that all believers can get equipped with a defense for their faith. Now, I know that some people are thinking here in this room right now, because I've done this enough to know, that, you know, thinking, why does he keep talking about the millions of years? I mean, what's the big deal about that? I mean, the Bible, after all, is a book of morality. I mean, we should stick with important doctrines of the Bible, but... Do you think if we could add millions of years into the Bible, do you think it might impact some important doctrines? Well, let's take a look at that. You see, 
The Bible has a lot of genealogies. Have you noticed that? They're both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. I think God thinks that they're very important. I think one reason is to show that Jesus was a direct descendant of Adam and to show all the people that lived there. But you see, in the, in the Old Testament, we have what's called chronogenealogies. You know those parts where it says so-and-so was so old when his son was born, and he was so old when his son was born, and he was so old when his son was born. You can actually do some mathematics, and you can add up each of those generations, and you'll actually get a reliable time span from Adam all the way up to Abraham. Would you agree with me so far? Okay. Now, after that, you notice God talks about history and gives a lot of years. He, always, he gives dates all the time. He says that this king ruled for so many years, followed by this king for this many years, and that Israel, Israel was in Egypt for this many years and this many days and stuff like that. Time is very important, but did you know this, that you can actually easily do mathematics and add up all of that time, and we'll get a reliable time span from Adam all the way up to Jesus. You with me so far? Now, if that's the case, and we believe evolution is true in the millions of years with it. Can we force millions of years between Adam and Jesus logically? No. So you know what people do, right? They say that each day in Genesis of creation represents millions of years. How many people have heard that idea? But I want to let you know that if you take that position, there's a huge theological problem, and I'm holding it in my hand right here. Because if we believe <clears throat> that each day in Genesis represents millions of years, that means before Adam, before the fall, before the curse, we have death. And in the fossil record, we have causes of death, including cancer. And God said his creation was very good. Does anybody think that cancer is very good? Let's take a look at that a little further. You see, in the last verse of Genesis chapter 1, God said this creation wasn't good, just good, but he said this time it was what? Very good. So what does a very good world look like? Well, check this out. Just a couple verses earlier, God said that I give you plants for food. Not to disappoint too many of you here today, but that means in that original creation, which was perfect, where there was no death, no sorrow, no pain, there was also no barbecue. But notice in the next verse, he gives the same command to the animals. He said, just, just as I gave you green plants for, or, or he said, I give you green plants for food. So if we're taking this as it's plainly written, that both man and animal were what? Vegetarian. Vegetarian, which comes from an ancient Hebrew term that means bad hunter. But just in case <laughs> you're feeling guilty, because maybe you had some bacon with your eggs this morning. I want to let you know, later on, God said, just as I gave you green plants for food, I now give you what? Everything for food, which some people use as biblical justification to eat these things. <laughs> but keep in mind, a very good world was a perfect paradise. There was no death, no sorrow, no pain. We were created in God's image, to live in complete communion with our creator. However, you all know we don't live in a world like that anymore, do we? You see, God commanded Adam. He said that when you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely what? Die. Die. You see, we do worship a gracious and a loving God, but he's also just. And we need to be thankful for that. But the penalty for disobedience, for sin, was death. And every descendant of Adam, which would include everyone in this room and everyone that ever has and ever will live, inherited that sin nature, and along with it, the penalty of death. That's a pretty sobering position, isn't it? However, God sent a rescue mission, didn't he? He sent his son who was God in the flesh, who lived a perfect life without any sin to become the lamb of God sacrificed for all. So that in the future, do you guys remember this in the Bible? It says that in the future, God will have a new heavens and a new earth. And guess what? There will be no more sorrow, no more death, no more pain. Is anybody else looking forward to that? And yet, 
if we say that those layers, that science proves that these layers represent millions of years, we're actually putting death before the fall, which turns the gospel upside down because the Bible has a paradise at the beginning and a paradise at the end. And nothing can change that. We need to believe the gospel. And if you don't think it's an important thing, maybe an atheist will convince you. This atheist in a debate with a Christian said the following. He said, the most devastating thing, though, that biology did to Christianity was the discovery of biological evolution. He said, now that we know that Adam and Eve were never real people, the central myth of Christianity is destroyed. Satheus went on to say, if there never was an Adam and Eve, then there never was an original sin. And guess what? If there never was an original sin, there's no need of salvation. And if there's no need of salvation, there's no need of a savior. And he concluded by saying, I submit, that puts Jesus, historical or otherwise, into the ranks of the unemployed. I think evolution is absolutely the death knell of Christianity. And he's right in that regard. And I know some people say you know, we shouldn't cause division in the church. I mean, the millions of years, they're okay. I mean, why should we limit a powerful God on how he created? But don't you think it's about time that we allow God to tell us how he created through his word? And speaking of causing a division in the church, how about this guy? About 505 years ago, he certainly caused a division in the church. And this is what he said on the subject. He said, when Moses writes that God created heaven and earth and whatever is in them in six days, if you cannot understand how this could have been done in six days, then please grant the Holy Spirit the honor of being more learned than you are. For you are to deal with scripture in such a way that you bear in mind that God himself says what is written, but since God is speaking, it is not fitting for you wantonly to turn his word in the direction you wish to go. Now, the nature of our culture might be better stated by a more modern theologian that you're familiar with. He said, the church used to hang the whole thing on one hook. If you don't do these things, if you don't act morally, then you're going to burn in hell. But listen to what he said next. He said, unfortunately, with what we know about science, anyone who thinks at all probably doesn't believe in that fire and brimstone stuff anymore. So you know what? The church has lost that voice to hold up their moral hand. Does that sound like anything else you've heard before? He's basically saying now that science has proven that the Bible's account of biology, geology, astronomy, and therefore history is wrong, then that means the morality contained in the same biblical text is therefore also wrong. So you Christians, you have no right to tell me how to live my life according to your Bible because your Bible has been scientifically proven to be wrong because evolution in millions of years are a fact. But you know what? If those Bible stories give you hope and purpose and meaning in your life, and if, if that helps you out, then that's okay. You can believe what you want to believe, and I'll just believe what I want to believe. And that way you'll be okay, and I'll be. Wait, am I going to be okay in an eternal perspective? But isn't this pretty much exactly a reflection of what our culture does. These are the kind of things that we need to demolish, these arguments that are standing up against not only our children and grandchildren knowing the truth, but also, as I said, our, our neighbors, our coworkers, those people God has called us to do. Now, we've only gotten to cover just a few topics today. There are so many more questions that people have challenging the historical account of the Bible. And the question is, are you prepared with a defense for your faith? Now, I hope you don't mind me being very practical right now. Um, how many of you perhaps have family members that are unsaved that have been told all their life that evolution and its millions of years are scientific fact, thus the Bible can't be true? And, and, and it can be an intellectual barrier from keeping them to even considering the Bible to be true in the first place. Uh, do you guys know that there is a battle going on for the souls of men waging right now? And if that's the case, should we go into battle unarmed? Are you equipped with the ammunition? So, again, I hope you don't mind me being practical. 
you may have said that saw that we brought some resources that are here in the back. And I don't know if you're anything like me. I remember about 10% of sermons for 10 minutes, and then poof, it's gone. I'm sure that's not true with Pastor David. But in any case, if you listen to a recording of his message a second or a third time, would you understand the information better? Right. That's called equipping, preparing yourself. Okay. And that is what 1 Peter 3.15 commands us to do. So again, I hope you don't mind being practical, but I do want to emphasize one particular resource that I think everybody should have in their home, and that is Creation Magazine. This has been around for over 40 years. It's the most read publication of its kind in the world. Um, it is very easy to understand. It's not going to be so thick with science you can't figure it out. There's a children's section in the middle. It's 56 pages. There's no advertising comes to your door every quarter. And I don't know if you guys have magazines that you get at home, but if you pulled out all the advertising, would you have 56 pages left? And yet, <laughs> what's left in here isn't just a good recipe for butternut squash. This is information that can have an eternal impact, not only on your faith, and it will do that. It will increase your faith in the Word of God. But better than that, it'll give you tools, practical, easy to understand tools that you can use for the sake of your children and grandchildren and those people that you, that God has called you to reach the Bible. So if you do subscribe to this uh, publication today, okay, you'll not only get the current issue uh, to take home with you and start reading this afternoon, but also um, the magazine's quarterly, but every month you'll receive a newsletter that will have more articles that you can use. In addition to that, you'll also get five digital copies of the magazine so that you and everyone in your family can have their own copy on their tablet or their smartphone or their laptop. If you do a two-year subscription instead of a one-year, we'll add into it two very good films, very good movies that we made. Doc this documentary, Trace the Voyage of Darwin, it's one that you will not be embarrassed to show your friends and it can start to, you can use it as a tool to start them understanding that maybe Darwin, if he knew all the evidence that we know today, might have come to a different conclusion than he did back then. Plus, you'll receive this. Uh, that documentary that I told you about where we went on college campuses, you'll see these, these uh, students in their own words tell why they left the faith along with the answers to their challenges. So in a moment when these forms, um, we're going to go ahead and... and um, uh, circulate these forms again. We just need information to put on there. And then if you do decide to equip your family, just go ahead and tear off that form and bring it back to the back, and we'll take care of that for you. Now, if you could go ahead and do that right now, and if you guys, again, could just take those and pass those back uh, to the back of the room, I would appreciate it. Now, while those are going around, I'm just going to give you two quick examples of information from Creation Magazine to show you how you can use this kind of information. How many people here have heard that carbon dating proves millions of years? Okay. Now, that is a very common belief, but let me just give you one example that we put in the magazine uh, where a, a sample was taken from a volcanic lava dome and the potassium argon dating method was used, and they got a date of 350,000 years. Then a mineral was extracted from the same sample, and this time it was 900,000. And another mineral was extracted, and this time it was up to 2.8 million. So folks, it was the same volcanic sample from a volcanic lava dome sent to the same potassium argon dating lab using the same mass spectrometer, but they got all these different dates. So which one do you think is right? You are correct, none of them. The reason is, is because this rock came from the Mount St. Helens volcanic lava dome and we knew exactly how old it was at the time the test went on. So if we have dates from radioisotope dating methods that are completely wrong from dates when we know the age, do you think it brings into question the assumptions that scientists use when we date rocks when we don't know the age? Can you see yourself sharing this kind of information? And then just one more. And if you guys haven't heard this, we featured this in the magazine and continue to keep getting questions about that. And that is that Dr. Mary Schweitzer, who was at the time at Montana State University studying under the great Jack Horner, found inside dinosaur bones, she found red blood cells. I want you to think about that for a moment. This is how she reacted. She said, I got goosebumps. It was exactly like looking at a slice of modern bone, but of course I couldn't, what? 
believe it. I said to the lab technician, the bones, after all, they are 65 million years old. How could blood cells survive that long? And it got even more exciting. As years passed, they dissolved the bony matrix and they found unfossilized soft fibrous tissue. They found transparent blood vessels where you could squeeze out liquid contents and found flexible and resilient tissue when stretch returned to its original shape. One example that's been repeated dozens of times, does that look 65 million years old to you? And listen to how she responded. She said it was totally shocking. I didn't believe it until we'd done it, what? 17 times. You guys remember when we were talking about operational science? You know, that when the evidence is right there in the present, right there in the laboratory, right before her eyes, and she said, I couldn't believe it. And you know what? I don't blame her. Because sometimes our faith in what we believe is very difficult to let go. However, I would like to share with you a different interpretation of this evidence on the back of my PhD colleagues. Would it be okay if I gave you a different interpretation? The dinosaur bones are not 65 million years old. Just an idea for you to consider. If you've appreciated this presentation, it's made a difference. If you know of another church, in another state, another country that might benefit from this, I have some pastor's packs that I would love to give you that you could hand to a pastor so that we could speak in more churches. You can find the answers on our website, which is, again, everybody? Creation.com. Now, besides the magazine, uh, I do want to just feature two things. Um, that would be the starter pack. Starter pack includes the answers book, which has answers to the most questions about Noah's in the ark, carbon dating, the ice age, dinosaurs, uh, which we'll be talking about in the next hour. And my favorite question, where did Cain get his wife when he wasn't able? Uh, also, <laughs> inside the starter pack, we have refuting evolution. This is the biggest selling creation book of all time. So consider getting the starter pack and, and or the answers book. Uh, Evolution's Achilles Heels, I believe, is the best thing that we've done in our over 40 years. This documentary won first place at the Christian Worldview Film, Worldview Film Festival. It features 15 PhD scientists demolishing the strongholds, the pillars that hold up evolution. It is a great witnessing tool. And just one more thing, if somebody here in the church wants to get this 12th part, uh, you could use it for community groups or, or a uh, home group. 12-part video series comes with a study guide. Somebody wants to get that for the church, that'd be great. But you see, resources like this didn't even exist 20 years ago, and I think right now is an exciting time to be a Christian. But I'd like to conclude with the, the question we started with today, and that is, are you willing to equip yourself with the answers and with a defense for your faith in this area, the creation and evolution issue, which is the biggest place where the Bible is being attacked. And if you don't believe me, just turn on your TV so that you can be the one that dives in and rescues the perishing and fulfill this command to always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. All right, thank you guys. Now, you might be thinking, wow, so with all the come to the table stuff that we've been doing for the last several months, many of the same things that we've been talking about, you heard about today, I probably must have prepped him or I, you know, no, it's just truth. And that's what we are all about is trying to let this truth enrich our own faith and then prepare us to go out and share that with other people who need it. And I am excited about how I believe this is even going to be another step. And I think that it, this date was randomly picked like months ago for him to be here. And the fact that we did our come to the table in October and then Brother Reg last week encouraging us out of that same passage there in Peter about how we need to be prepared to give an answer for those that ask the reason of the hope that's within us. And then having this happen, and as we go into the Thanksgiving and Christmas seasons, I think this is going to help us all to be prepared for family members, friends, whoever we might come across to be able to give them that answer. And then I think this is just going to continue to equip us to be prepared for what I'm hoping next spring 
has said, will you be praying with me that God will open a door for us to be able to go to Sierra College next spring and be able to try to reach some of these young people that have never heard these truths before. They've never heard that there was any, it's always just been, no, oh, those, those Bible people, they're just crazy. They like to deny evidence because they've got their faith. But a big thing about this is that we need to be prepared to give that answer for whoever may come to us. You know, he quoted from an atheist, uh, one of my favorite atheists, I jokingly say that, is uh, Penn Jillette several years ago gave an interview. And somebody had given him a Bible and they were asked, he was kind of talking about this guy. He said he was sane, he wasn't some crazy person, but he gave him a Bible and he said, I'm not offended by that at all because... How much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? How much do you have to hate someone to believe that there is an everlasting life and not tell them? Hey, Christian, that's on us. God's left us here now to spread the truth of the gospel. Now, you may not be able to give all these various defenses for creationism. But you can share your story about what Christ has done in your heart and in your life. Maybe you came today and you've got questions about things or maybe you'd like to pray with somebody about something God has on your heart. During this last song that we're going to sing, I encourage you to come forward. We'll have people at the back. We'll have people here at the front. Maybe grab somebody close by you and just say, hey, I'd like to pray. I'm hurting right now. I'd like, I'd like to know that God does care about me, that God does love me. I'd like to know that there's some people here that I, I'm looking for a church home. Maybe you've been kind of wandering for a while from church to church trying to find some place. Hey, welcome home. We'd love to have you here. But whatever it is on your heart now, let's just take some time and let's sing this last song together, but let's also do some business. So maybe if you were convicted saying, yeah, I've got somebody, you would like to pray that God would give you an opportunity during the holidays to be able to witness to them. And let's pray about that person. Let's take that, that person's name to the Lord today. And then let's get you equipped to be ready for God to use you to be his mouthpiece to share the good news of Christ. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. And we thank you for this time that we could be here to worship you, to learn more about the truth that you have for us. And God, just thank you that you're always with us. And Lord, sometimes we, we may want things to happen faster than they do. Maybe you, there are people that have been praying for family members or, or neighbors or, or someone that they deeply love for years or, or decades now. But God, let us patiently continue to plow the fields. Let us continue to patiently wait for your time. But God, prepare us and use us to do your will to share your wonderful gospel. In Jesus' name, amen.